Well, good morning, Grant Memorial. Good morning. My name is Cam. I'm one of the pastors here, and uh, we're so glad that you have joined us today. I trust that you are all uh, well rested from spring break or Easter holidays, and I hope that the love of God was highlighted to you at some point over this past week or so as you had the opportunity to reflect on the death and resurrection of Christ. Well, pastor and author Francis Chan uses a really great illustration when talking about where our lives fit in the grand story of of God's plan. And what he does is he invites us to think about the history of the world as a movie. Well, since the average movie is around two hours, if we were to spread out world history from creation until, you know, about where we are now into a two-hour timeline, our lives, each and every one of us, would account for a mere two seconds or so of the movie. And that's likely being generous. Now, let me ask you, if you saw a movie... Would you conclude that an extra who only had two seconds of screen time was the main character of the story? Probably not. And yet many of us live our two seconds as if we are the main character, right? As if our storyline is the primary script and the world revolves in many ways around us. Now, when you think about this movie, the story of the world, when all is said and done, who will ultimately prove to be the main character? God, right? God will prove to be undeniably the main character. He appears in the opening scene, the closing scene, and every scene in between. You see, while everyone else contributes a mere two seconds, God is the central figure of the entire thing. Now, here's the point that Chan makes. He says that some two-second clips in every movie play a significant role in the plot. So think about uh, the moment Darth Vader tells Luke that he is his father in The Empire Strikes Back. A pretty important two seconds. Or the two seconds that we find out Bambi's mom has been shot in Disney's Bambi. (laughs) Important two seconds. Well, on the other hand, other two-second segments are completely unnecessary. How many of you have ever got up to go to the bathroom in the mid-movie, and when you came back, you still knew everything that was going on? Right? You didn't miss anything important. Some segments are simply not needed and don't actually contribute that much to the overall plot and point. They're at best unnecessary and at worst maybe even a distraction from the plot. And Chan says that it's up to us if our two seconds are going to contribute to the plot of the story by pointing toward the main character and supporting the overall narrative. See, we all have a decision to make about if we will listen to the director and play the role that God has for us to play in his story, or if we'll do our own thing, spending our two seconds on ourselves, on our own storylines that have nothing to do with the big picture, or simply put, living lives fit for the cutting room floor. You see, while we are not the main character, the story is not about us, God has invited us to play a supporting role in the story, to join him in what he's doing with the precious screen time that we have been given. Or in other words, we're invited to be faithful, minor characters. Well, this morning, uh, as we continue our study through the Old Testament book of Genesis, we come across a faithful minor character whose mere two pages of scripture leave a mark on the story that goes well beyond his screen time. And to read about him, I invite you to turn with me in your copy of the scriptures to Genesis chapter 24. Now, just a heads up, uh, this is a long passage today. So get those Bibles out and buckle up and pay attention because we won't be able to unpack this uh, verse by verse in the way that we normally do. But we're going to read the entirety of chapter 24. I'll try and read quick. You know how pilots say we're going to try and pick up a little extra time in the air? I'll try and do that this morning. Okay, Genesis chapter 24, starting at verse 1. Abraham 
was now very old, and the Lord had blessed him in every way. He said to the senior servant in his household, the one in charge of all he had, put your hand under my thigh. I want you to swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not get away from my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I am living, but will go to my country and my own relatives and get a wife for my son Isaac. The servant asked him, what if the woman is unwilling to come back with me to this land? Shall I then take your son back to the country you came from? Make sure that you do not take my son back there, Abraham said. The Lord God of heaven who brought me out of my father's household and my native land and who spoke to me and promised me an oath saying to your offspring I will give this land. He will send his angel before you so that you can get a wife for my son there. If the woman is unwilling to come back with you, then you will be released from this oath of mine. Only do not take my son back there. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of his master Abraham and swore an oath to him concerning this matter. Then the servant left, taking with him ten of his master's camels, loaded with all kinds of good things from his master. He set out for uh, for Aram Naharim and made his way to the town of Nahor. He had the camels kneel down near the well outside the town. It was toward evening, the time the women go out to draw water. Then he prayed, Lord, God of my master Abraham, make me successful today and show kindness to my master Abraham. See, I am standing beside this spring and the daughters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. May it be that when I say to a young woman, please let down your jar that I may have a drink. And she says, drink and I'll water your camels too. Let her be the one you have chosen for your servant Isaac. By this I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. Before he had finished praying, Rebekah came out with a jar on her shoulder. She was the daughter of Bethuel, son of Milcah, who was the wife of Abraham's brother Nahor. The woman was very beautiful, a virgin. No man had ever slept with her. She went down to the spring, filled her jar, and came back up again. The servant hurried to meet her and said, Please, give me a little water from your jar. Drink, my lord, she said, and quickly lowered the jar to her hands and gave him a drink. After she had given him a drink, she said, I'll draw water for your camels too until they've had enough to drink. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough, ran back to the well to draw more water and drew enough for all his camels. Without saying a word, the man watched her closely to learn whether she, whether or not the Lord had made his journey successful. When the camels had finished drinking, the man took out a gold nose ring weighing a a bika and two gold bracelets weighing 10 shekels. Then he asked, whose daughter are you? Please tell me, is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? She answered him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, born to Nahor. And she added, we have plenty of straw and fodder as well as room for you to spend the night. The man bowed down and worshiped the Lord, saying, praise be to the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not abandoned his kindness and faithfulness to my master. As for me, the Lord has led me on the journey to the house of my master's relatives. The young woman ran and told her mother's household about these things. Now, Rebecca had a brother named Laban, and he hurried out to meet the man at the spring. As soon as he had seen the nose ring and the bracelets on his sister's arms and had heard Rebecca tell what the man said to her, he went out to the man and found him standing by the camels near the spring. Come, you who are blessed by the Lord, he said. Why are you standing out here? I prepared the house and a place for the camels. So the man went to the house and the camels were unloaded. Straw and fodder were brought in for the camels and the water for him and his men to wash their feet. Then food was set before him and he said, I will not eat until I've told you what I have to say. Then tell us, Laban said. So he said, I'm going to speed up a little bit on this part because it's kind of what we've already read. I am Abraham's servant. The Lord has blessed my master abundantly and he's become wealthy. He has given up, given him sheep and cattle, silver and gold, male and female servants and camels and donkeys. My master's wife, Sarah, has borne him a son in her old age, and he has given him everything he owns. And my master made me swear an oath and said, you must not get a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I live, but go to my father's family and to my own clan and get a wife for my son. Then I asked my master, what if the woman will not come back with me? He replied, the Lord before whom I have walked faithfully will send his angel with you and make your journey a success so that you will get a wife for my son and from my own clan and from my master's family. You will be released from my oath if when you go to my clan, they refuse to give her to you. Then you will be released from my oath. 
When I came to the spring today, I said, Lord, God of my master Abraham, if you will, please grant me success on the journey in which I've come. See, I am standing beside this spring. If a young woman comes out to draw water and I say to her, please let me drink a little water from your jar. And if she says to me, drink and I'll draw water for your camels too, let her be the one the Lord has chosen for my master's son. Before I finished praying in my heart, Rebecca came out with a jar on her shoulder. She went down to the spring and drew water and I said to her, please give me a drink. She quickly lowered her jar from her shoulder and said, drink and I'll water your camels too. So I drank and she watered the camels also. I asked her, whose daughter are you? She said, the daughter of Bethuel, son of Nahor, whom Milcah bore to him. Then I put the ring in her nose and the bracelet on her arms, and I bowed down and worshiped the Lord. I praised the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who led me on the right road to get the granddaughter of my, my master's brother for his son. Now, if you will show me kindness and faithfulness to my master, tell me, and if not, tell me, so I may know which way to return. Laban and Bethuel answered, This is from the Lord. We can say nothing to you one way or the other. Here is Rebekah. Take her and go, and let her become the wife of your master's son, as the Lord directed. When Abraham's servant heard what they said, he bowed down to the ground before the Lord. Then the servant brought out gold and silver jewelry and articles of clothing and gave them to Rebekah. He also gave costly gifts to her brother and to her mother. Then he and the men who were with him ate and drank and spent the night there. When they got up the next morning, he said, send me on my way to my master. But her brother and her mother replied, let the young woman remain with us 10 days or so, and then you may go. But he said to them, do not detain me. Now that the Lord has granted success to my journey, send me on my way, on my way so I may go to my master. And they said, let's call the young woman and ask her about it. So they called Rebecca and asked her, will you go with this man? I will go, she said. So they sent her sister Rebekah on her way, along with her nurse and Abraham's servant and his men, and they blessed Rebekah and said to her, Our sister, may you increase to thousands upon thousands. May your offspring possess the cities of their enemies. Then Rebekah and her attendants got ready and mounted the camels and went back with the man. So the servant took Rebekah and left. Now Isaac had come from Bir Lahai Roy, for he was living in the Negev. He went out to the field one evening to meditate, and as he looked up, he saw camels approaching. Rebecca also looked up and saw Isaac. She got down from her camel and asked the servant, who is that man in the field coming to meet us? He is my master, the servant answered. So she took her veil and covered herself. Then the servant told Isaac all he had done. Isaac brought her into the tent of his mother, Sarah, and he married Rebecca. So she became his wife, and he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we pray today as we dig in, Lord, that you would teach us, that you would change us through it this morning. Amen. <clears throat> Told you it was a long passage. <clears throat> well, in case it wasn't obvious, the faithful minor character in this passage, who plays a role that has significant influence well beyond his time, is Abraham's faithful servant. And that's how we know him. Well, every other primary character in this text is given a name. Abraham's servant is simply referred to as the servant or the man throughout the passage. But it's through this nameless character that God provides a wife for Isaac through whom God's people would expand and ultimately through whom the world would be saved. Now, we're going to pick up with Abraham's servant in just a moment, but first, a little context for the passage that we just read. You see, this text picks up right after the death of Sarah, Abraham's wife and matriarch of God's people, right? If you recall from our passage three weeks ago, before we took a break for baptisms and Easter, Sarah had passed away. And Abraham secured his first and only plot of land in Canaan in order to bury her in the land that God had promised to them and their descendants. And this marked a significant moment for this wandering, sojourning people as they moved from foreigners to locals in the promised land. Well, what we read in our passage today is Abraham's reaction to seeing his wife pass away. You see, up until this point, Abraham was the clear leader of God's people. And the future likely seemed like something that would happen, well, in the future. 
And so prior to our passage today, there have been few action steps taken to ensure that Abraham's people could carry on without him. But mourning the death of his wife, who was 10 years his junior, likely reminded Abraham that his life was not guaranteed for much longer. And so Abraham makes it a priority at this point to find a son, find a wife for his son Isaac as soon as possible, so that this line that God had promised would continue to grow into the nation it was intended to even after Abraham's passing. However, the issue was, who would Isaac marry? Right? Where would this wife come from? He, he surely couldn't marry a Canaanite woman because he would just be absorbed into the culture of the locals and that would spell the end of God's people. Perhaps this dilemma is why it's taken this long for Abraham to actually get moving on this. Because he didn't know where to turn for a wife that would be pure and give her allegiance to this new nation and people. Well, thankfully, the answer to this question came to Abraham just prior to Sarah's death. If we flip back to Genesis 22, there was a short and seemingly insignificant text sandwiched between the testing of Abraham with Isaac at Moriah and the death of Sarah. Look at Genesis 22, 20 to 24. Sometime later, Abraham was told, Milcah is also a mother. She has borne sons to your brother Nahor. Uz, the firstborn, Buzz, his brother, clever name choices, Kemuel, the father of Aram, Kesed, Hazel, Pildash, Jildpah, and Bethuel. Bethuel became the father of Rebekah. Milcah bore these eight sons to Abraham's brother Nahor. His concubine, whose name was Reuma, had also had sons, Teba, Geham, Tahash, and Makah. That's the kind of text that seems insignificant, right? We just kind of zoom over it. We just had action on the hill as Abraham almost sacrifices Isaac. And then we move over to the death of Sarah and this incredible purchase of land. But sandwiched in between is this seemingly relative, seemingly unimportant text. But this text turns out to be of utmost importance for God's people. Right? Look at verse 20 again. Sometime later, Abraham was told, and what he's told is about the family he had left behind in Haran. Do you remember how Abraham's journey began? For those of of us who have kind of walked this entire journey together, this is a map that we looked at uh, several months ago when we were first introduced to Abraham. Now, you might recall that Abraham and his family were born and raised in the ancient Mesopotamian city of Ur, which is way down at the bottom of the screen, right? And what we knew about Ur is that it's a hotbed of moon worship, and God pulled them out of that. But, some, but God then came to Abraham and told him to travel towards the land of Canaan. And so Abraham, along with his wife Sarah, their orphaned nephew Lot, His father Terah, his brother brother Nahor, and his wife Milcah made their way up from Ur and settled in a place called Haran, right? They went way up up north in Mesopotamia to Haran. And it's in Haran where Abraham's father died and where his brother Nahor chose to stay even when Abraham, Sarah, and Lot headed towards Canaan. Does this all ring a bell? I'm sorry if you're just joining us now. Hopefully this was an okay uh, summary. But we start in Ur. They headed up to Haran. And then Abraham, Sarah, and Lot went down to Canaan with Nahor and the rest of the family staying in Haran. And so this mini genealogy in Genesis 22 tells us that Abraham was informed, how we don't know, that his brother Nahor had started a family up in Haran. So after decades of separation and a lack of knowledge of what happened to his family over all these years, Abraham realizes that he has a line of relatives up north in Haran. And it's with this information that he decides that Isaac's wife should come from his family line rather than from those they've come across in Canaan or the servants that they have picked up over the years. 
And so it's in this context, the recent death of Sarah and the reminder of his own imminent death, as well as the realization of a line of blood relatives in Haran that, Abra- that were introduced to this important supporting character as Abraham tells his servant to travel up to Haran to his brother's descendants to find a wife for Isaac. Verse 2, he said to his senior servant in his household, the one in charge of all that he had, put your hand under my thigh. I want you to swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not get a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I am living, but will go to my country and my own relatives and get a wife for my son, Isaac. Okay, so a couple things to note here. First, we see how important this endeavor to find a wife for Isaac is to Abraham by the vow that he gets his chief servant to perform. Now, just so we all get a tangible understanding of what is happening, I want you to turn to your neighbor and place your hand under... No, I'm just joking. (laughs) We're we're not actually going to do that. No oaths will be made here today. But, but this is admittedly a strange and very personal oath, right? right? We don't know the exact significance of it, but it's likely connected to the covenant of circumcision, right? The hand placement is in an area that would represent and remind those involved of God's covenant promise. And so Abraham was likely invoking the power and presence of the Lord God Almighty in this oath, connecting the importance of this task to the very existence of God's special people. But regardless of the exact meaning, we know that this process is not a flippant exercise, right? You didn't do this before going to the store. And it was specific to Abraham's insistence that Isaac find a wife who was not a Canaanite. So we know that this task was important. Well, secondly, we begin to learn a little bit about this nameless servant. Verse 2 says that he was Abraham's senior servant in charge of all that Abraham had. This was no ordinary servant. This was the CEO of Abraham Corp. Second in command only to Abraham entrusted with everything that Abraham had. Well, church, this description actually lets us know who specifically this servant is. And we've actually read about this man before. Do you remember in Genesis 15, as Abraham complained to God about being childless, this is before Isaac came along, he said this in 15 verse 2, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abraham said, you've given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. This chief servant that we read about in today's text, well, nameless in this account is almost certainly Eleazar of Damascus, the very one who would have inherited Abraham's entire estate if God had not miraculously provided Isaac in his old age. Now think about that for a minute. The coming of Isaac kept Eleazar from inheriting everything, right? It kept him from moving from servant to leader of this people. And yet here we see him carefully and faithfully securing a future for Abraham's people without himself at the helm. And so immediately here we learn about the righteous character of Eleazar, the servant, You see, if this story were a movie, you'd better believe that this guy would be the villain of the story, right? How many times have you seen that storyline before? The one who is next in line to the throne or company control is impeded by the de facto second in command in a struggle for power, right? That's basically the storyline for The Lion King, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, Billy Madison, Tommy Boy, Thor Ragnarok, Snow White and the Huntsman, Richie Rich, just to name a few off the top of my head. We expect this individual to be power hungry, right? Less than excited about his inheritance being taken from him. And yet what we see is a humble servant faithfully fulfilling his master's wishes. Not only conceding power and rule, but enabling it to happen and then celebrating it when it does. 
And it's, this is the first thing that we see about being a faithful minor character through the example of Eleazar. He obeyed his calling. Right? He obeyed his calling. Verse 10, at Abraham's direction, the servant left, taking with him 10 of his master's camels loaded with all kinds of good things from his master. He set out for Aram Naharim, which is used interchangeably with Haran throughout the scriptures, just FYI, and made his way to the town of Nahor, or in short, he did what he was told. When Abraham invited him to participate in the process of securing a wife for Isaac, Eleazar humbly obeyed, traveling to Nahor's town in Haran. And church, this journey to find Isaac a wife wasn't a walk in the park or simply a couple swipes right on a dating app. This journey, depending on where they were at the time, if they were in Hebron or Beersheba, would have been between 700 and 1,000 kilometers, right? Between 700 and 1,000 kilometers and would have taken well over a month, if not months. Eliezer counted the cost and served at the pleasure of his master, not only going begrudgingly, but taking his call seriously, seeking to be successful in what he was tasked to do. Now, our contemporary minds wonder why Isaac didn't go on this journey, right? This seems odd, right? This, that a servant of Abraham, seemingly without Isaac's knowledge, goes to find a wife for him rather than Isaac going on a road trip to find his own bride, But first of all, that's not the way marriage worked back then. Spouses were chosen by representative heads of households, fathers, eldest brothers, or their representatives, as we see in this case. And secondly, Abraham actually forbids Isaac from leaving Canaan. Look at verse 6 to 8. Make sure that you do not take my son back there, Abraham said. The Lord God of heaven who brought me out of my father's household in my native land, who spoke to me and promised me an oath saying, to your offspring I will give this land. He will send his angel before you so that you can get a wife for my son from there. If the woman is unwilling to come back with you, then you will be released from this oath of mine. Only do not take my son back there. Abraham wanted Isaac, the heir of the promise, to remain in the land God had given them. If he were to leave to go find a wife, he may stay when he found her and would bring about the end of the promise that Abraham's people would inherit the land of Canaan. Isaac was to stay in the land where he was born and the land he would inherit, not to go off to the land of his ancestors where things would be easy and attractive for him to settle. And so it is a caravan of representatives led by Abraham's chief servant, Eleazar, that that travels this significant distance to find Isaac a wife. Well, it doesn't take long once they arrive in Haran, where Nahor's family has settled, for the action to pick up. And it's here where we see Eleazar seek the Lord. That's the second thing. Eleazar sought the Lord. Eliezer was not only faithful to Abraham, but he displays here a faith in God as well, as evidenced by his calling upon the Lord to guide him. You see, Eliezer, who had never been to this land before, he didn't know who he was looking for or what he might find, and so he depended upon God to lead him on this mission, beginning with his prayer upon his arrival in the town of Nahor. Verse 12. When he arrived, he prayed. Lord, God of my master Abraham, make me successful today and show kindness to my master Abraham. One thing for us to notice is that Eliezer didn't end with prayer. He started with prayer. He didn't start praying after he had exhausted his own efforts, right? It wasn't that all the women had come and gone and then he goes, okay, God, you got to help me. Right? Eliezer comes to God with all of his options still before him. It's important to be people, no matter the circumstances, who start with prayer. Next, uh, as he prays, we see Eleazar trusted God's providence. Right? He trusted in the providence of God. As he prays, Eleazar asks God to reveal his will to him. Verse 13 and 14. See, I am standing beside this spring, 
and the daughters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. May it be that when I say to a woman, please let down your jar that I may have a drink, and she says, drink, and I'll water your camels too, let her be the one you've chosen for your servant Isaac. By this I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. Now there's something to be said for, put, for not putting God to the test. And I would say that this text is more descriptive than prescriptive for us. But notice that Eleazar doesn't ask God for a miraculous sign, right? He could have prayed, God, please make the one that I'm supposed to choose glow as she walks towards me, right? Or he could have said, hey, have one of the camels whisper to me when the right one comes along, right? Here, he's not actually praying for the miraculous. He's trusting that God is always working, And that he reveals his will in everyday occurrences. His prayer is that God would reveal the right woman to him by showing him a woman of good character and a hospitable servant heart. Which God would have needed to develop throughout her whole life. I think church often, while we're looking for the miraculous, we can miss God's hand at work in the natural world that he's created. Right? But Eleazar knows that God doesn't simply work in the moment or the moment that we pray, but God has been preparing Isaac's wife since before he or she were even born. He knows that God has more invested in this union than Eleazar does. And so he trusts in what God has been doing for decades because this is just one small step in the process of God in his sovereignty leading Isaac and Rebekah together. And wouldn't you know it, God's sovereignty prevails. Look at verse 15. Before he had finished praying, before he had finished praying, Rebecca came out with a jar on her shoulder. So what does that mean? It means that this meeting was in motion before Eleazar even started praying. Right? This encounter was not created by Eleazar. And it wasn't even in response to his prayer that it happened. Think about it. Rachel, or Rebecca needed to have got up and left the house heading to the well before Eliezer had even started praying in order for this timing to work. Right? God didn't need to be invited to work here. He was already at work. And Eliezer knew that when he prayed in verse 14, God, show me the one that you've already chosen. Right? Eliezer's job wasn't to choose Isaac's wife. That was God's job. And Eliezer trusted that God in his providence had done his job. God, show me the one who you have chosen. And so church, one thing I think we learn here is that prayer and trusting in God is as much us saying, God, open my eyes to what you are already doing as it is convincing him that something needs to be done. Right? Can I say that again? Prayer and trusting in God is as much us saying, God, open my eyes to what you're already doing as it is convincing him that something needs to be done. Well, verse 15 and 16 tell us, the reader, about who this Rebekah is. Verse 15. She was the daughter of Bethuel, son of Milcah, who was the wife of Abraham's brother Nahor. The woman was very beautiful, a virgin. No man had ever slept with her. So this beautiful young woman coming to the well was Abraham's brother Nahor's granddaughter. Okay, that's a mouthful, but it's Abraham's brother's granddaughter. And she, while being of marrying age, as the language implies, was not herself yet married. And then over the next few verses, God confirms this to Eleazar. So the text tells us who she is, and then we see Eliezer come to what we already know, that Rebekah is in fact the one that God has set apart for Isaac. And he confirms this for Eliezer as she not only waters Eliezer's camels, verse 19, and 19 to 21, showing herself to be hospitable and generous and confirming the sign that Eliezer asked for, but as she confirms her link to Abraham's bloodline as well revealing that she's the granddaughter of Nahor, the brother of Abraham, in verse 24. Now, just as an aside, because I found this interesting, Rebecca's work of watering Eliezer's camels was a significant task. R. Kent Hughes writes this. 
What is most astonishing is that Rebecca volunteered to water his 10 camels. To grasp what a wonder this was, we must understand that the ancient well was a large deep hole in the earth with steps leading down to the spring water, so that each drawing of water required, required substantial effort. And more, a camel typically would drink about 25 gallons of water, and an ancient water jar held about three gallons of water. This means that Rebecca made between 80 and 100 descents into the well. As to the amount of time she gave this, a camel takes about 10 minutes to drink its full complement of water. Rebecca's labors filled one and a half to two sweaty hours. Right? This was not a simple, merely polite gesture that anyone would do, like offering to take someone's coat when they come to the door. Right? This was an extravagant statement about the character of Rebecca and her willingness to serve the foreigner something of utmost importance to a wandering community like Abraham's. Well, as these things came to light, this young woman, uh, that this young woman was the one, we see that Eleazar worshiped freely, right? His response, verse 26 to 27, then the man bowed down and worshiped the Lord, saying, praise be to the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not abandoned his kindness and faithfulness to my master. As for me, the Lord has led me on the journey to the house of my master's relatives. Right in front of Rebecca, he hits the deck. Right, right in front of Rebecca, who likely didn't fully know what was going on at this point. Eleazar dropped to the ground and praised the Lord for his provision. Praised the Lord that God had provided what he asked for. He didn't whisper or sort of look up, playing it cool, right? Giving God a knowing look. You know, yeah, God. Right? Like we kind of often do, like we half sheepishly pray around the lunch table at work or, you know, in a restaurant kind of looking up as the waiter gone. Right? Her praise, his praise was public. Right? He had found the one he was sent to find. God had been faithful. And this stance continues throughout the story with Eleazar bowing to the ground before the Lord in verse 52, right in the middle of Rebekah's family. Right? And notice that his public worship leads others to celebrate the Lord as well. Right? His worship at the well led Rebekah to run home with joy in verse 28 to tell her family. And his worship in their home led them to exclaim in verse 50, this is from the Lord. Hey, church, I think we underestimate the impact that our worship of God can have on those around us. Right? When we celebrate what God is doing in our lives and point out his goodness in the presence of those we're with. Well, this leads us directly into what Eleazar did out of his worship. It says he gave glory to God. Right? In short, Eleazar told the story. He started at the beginning and he recounted every detail as we read from verse 34 to 49 so that others would know what God had done. Did anyone else, as I was reading, think that the repetition of this passage was a bit unnecessary? Right? We basically read the story twice this morning, almost word for word. And while it seemed redundant, I think that's the point. Eleazar, after experiencing the gracious provision of the Lord, shared every detail with all who would listen. First, he tells Rebecca's family, recounting every detail, in part to persuade them to acknowledge that this is from the Lord, but also in part to simply celebrate how good God is. We also see Eleazar recount the story to Isaac upon returning with Rebecca. Verse 66 says, Then the servant told Isaac all he had done. Right? It's a funny picture because you've got Rebecca and Isaac, they lay eyes on each other, right? It's kind of like the love moment in the story where they're like, and they're going to walk towards each other. And Eleazar jumps in the middle. He's like, Isaac, I got to tell you what happened, right? He kind of interrupts this romantic moment, but he just has to tell him. He reports all that he had done before they're even able to meet, right? He recounted this story when he returned, and we know that when he eventually got back to Abraham, he would have recounted this story again, right? God had provided, and Eliezer wanted everyone to know every detail so they knew, and they could praise God too. Friends, I can't imagine the stories of God that we have between us in this room, 
Stories of grace, mercy, forgiveness, healing, provision. Each of us has a story to tell about the goodness of God, or we likely wouldn't be here. My encouragement, based off the example of Eleazar, is to be a storyteller. Right? Share the ways God has worked in your life, both to those around you and to those who may not know God. Within your community, within our community, to edify the body, to enhance our worship of the God who works in the lives of those who seek him. Right? If you have a story to tell that you think may encourage our church or those who may not know Jesus yet, please reach out to us. And let us help you tell your story so that God will be glorified, that the church would be edified, and that his kingdom would be magnified. Now, speaking of stories, what is a love story without a little bit of suspense? In every romantic narrative, think rom-com, there's a moment that the relationship in question, uh, or that the, there's a moment in which the relationship is put in question, right? There's an obstacle that threatens to ruin the whole thing, right? Will they get together? Won't they get together, right? Right? And this love story of Rebecca and Isaac is no different. You see, after Laban and his mother, the night before, had agreed to send Rebecca to marry Isaac, they rescind in the morning, asking Eleazar to wait a little bit. Verse 55, but her brother and mother replied, let the young woman remain with us 10 days or so, then you may go. Here, they ask for an indefinite delay. Right? Did you notice the or so in this suggestion? And from what we'll read about Laban in the chapters to come, this 10 days would likely have turned into something much longer as this is the same Laban who will trick his nephew Jacob into 20 years of labor to marry his daughter. But when faced with this obstacle, Eleazar persisted. Right? He persisted, verse 56. But he said to them, do not detain me. Right? Let me go. Now that the Lord has granted me success to my journey, send me on my way that I may go to my master. Sorry, guys, I can't wait. Right? Rather than relaxing, going, hey, that actually might be nice. I can kick back for a few extra days in Haran, eating good food, being treated like royalty. But Eliezer doesn't get distracted and persists in what he's been called to do. Right? His master's will, his role in the story was to find Isaac's wife and bring her home. And that is what he intended to do. You see, until they returned to Isaac, Eliezer knew his job was not done. And church, there's much we can learn from this persistence, this focus on doing what we're called to do in spite of the obstacles or distractions in our way. But Eliezer kept his focus on what God had tasked him with, despite the threat that his journey would be unfruitful or the temptation to take a detour. Well, perhaps in an attempt to keep her with them, Laban and his mother go back on their word and they leave their decision in the hands of Rebecca, asking her if she would choose to stay or to go. And Rebecca, still likely excited about the ways in which God orchestrated this encounter as told by Eleazar, says yes to God by saying yes to going with Eleazar. Verse 58, I will go, she said. And after a few goodbyes, Rebecca, her servant nurse, and some of her attendants mounted the camels to make the long journey to what would become their home. Well, as we read, the passage ends with the caravan returning safely to Canaan after another month or two or three. And Rebecca marrying Isaac, who the text says loved her very much. Which leads us to the final statement about Eleazar and essentially the result of the rest of the list. In this ending, we see that Eleazar was used by God. Right? By the grace of God, Eleazar was successful on his journey. He kept his oath and honored the request of Abraham, all the while being used by God to accomplish his purposes for his chosen people. And that church is the story of Eleazar. While well, we're just beginning the story of Isaac and Rebecca, this is the last that we read about this servant, the humble servant whose small role, whose two seconds of screen time was used by a big God in a really significant way. 
And that's my prayer for all of us, that each and every one of us would be faithful, minor characters in the grand story of God as we obey our calling, as we seek the Lord, as we trust in God's providence, as we worship freely, as we give glory to God and persist amid trials, as he uses us for his glory, for his purposes, as his story unfolds. Well, at this point, uh, we're going to move into communion as we do on the first Sunday of every month, celebrating the truth that the main character, Jesus Christ, laid down his life so that we, the minor characters, the ones with the bit parts, can be a part of the eternal story of God. Now, if you're at home I encourage you to grab the elements where you are so you can participate with us. And for those who are here, if you haven't received the elements yet, just raise your hand where you are and uh, our hosts will come forward and they'll make sure that you have elements so you can participate with us. But for the next few minutes as the worship team comes forward, I invite you to thank God for the great story, the story of redemption that he has been writing from the beginning and for inviting us to be a part of the story through our salvation, as recipients of his saving work, and through our own involvement as his salvation goes out to every corner of the earth. Jesus, we thank you that you were faithful to a cross. Help us to be faithful, to remember well, to celebrate, and to point towards the cross. Amen. Let's reflect on the work of Christ.